65 years ago, uh, the liberation troops from the Soviet Union, the United States, and Great Britain started going into the concentration and death camps of Europe. And it really was about 65 years ago. They started in 1944 at Maidanek and then 1945 in the other camps. And what they saw, of course, and some of us have seen those photos, probably all of us have, is emaciated bodies and corpses strewn all over the ground. And they were horrified by witnessing the event. What they also saw, however, was some of the artwork created by the prisoners and were shocked by what they saw, were mesmerized by it. And I've been teaching literature of the Holocaust for 25 years, believe it or not, and I didn't know anything about the art. I was a student of the Holocaust and went to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. when it opened in 1993 and met a woman named Sybil Milton that did a seminar, the first seminar for college teachers at the museum in Washington, D.C., and it was on art and music of the Holocaust. So I'm going to give her the credit for opening up my eyes to what has become almost an obsession. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the art created in the ghettos, in the concentration camps, and in the death camps of Europe by the prisoners. I'm also going to talk a little bit about some artwork that was done by artists in hiding. Okay, And I think we can all appreciate the way that this art was done. It was clandestine. Because as we know, that any prisoner caught creating unofficial art by the SS would be killed or at least punished severely. So all this was clandestine art. And although you'll see different images and it'll be hard to understand, that we have to remember there were two obstacles. One is creating the art. They didn't have supplies. They had to make supplies. So they used, for example, straw. They used feathers. They used human hair, if they could get, get, go into the barber shop and get those. They used anything they could. They used chalk ground up in stagnant water. So they had to create materials to create their artworks. Then they had to hide their artworks. So it wasn't just difficult to create the works of art, but they had to hide them. Almost all the works, and it's hard to tell it with the scale, obviously, especially on a really big screen, but almost every work is the size of a, let's see, eight and a half by 10 inch paper or smaller. And some of the work is considerably smaller. Um, what they did in the years during World War II was to create art and it served several purposes. One was to serve as witness, to witness what was happening to them. Every artist that I've spoken to, I've only spoken to about 10 or so, but every one of them said the same thing. They felt at a certain point in their incarceration that they were not going to survive. Okay, they understood that. And I always tell my students, they ask how many survived the camps. And I, the best figure that I can come up with, which is what scholars, other scholars come up with, is about 5%. And they understood at one point chances of survival in Auschwitz, for example, or Sobibor, Treblinka, whatever, was minimal. So although they felt they probably would not survive, they needed to serve as witness. And one way to serve as witness, obviously, was to create works of art, to get these works of art out to the public. The greatest fear that every person had in the camps was that the story would never be told, that this would remain a secret. And so they didn't have cameras, obviously. They created works of art, paintings, but usually drawings or what have you, to serve as witness. The second thing is, that they created works of art to remind themselves of something that all of us take for granted, and that is that they were still human. Because as we know, when we study the Holocaust, it wasn't just mass murder. It was dehumanization as well as murder. So they took one, at least they attempted to take one's humanity before they took one's life. And every artist, again, said the same thing. One person said it very simply and directly. I became human again, he said, when I began to draw. And so we need to understand that. It's not just serving as witness. It's reminding themselves of their humanity. To me, it's spiritual and psychological resistance to dehumanization, as I talked about before, and it is an affirmation of life. And although these works of art, save the first one, 
are pretty difficult to look at. But we need to understand this was their cry. This was their human cry. And it's absolutely wonderful. I take great satisfaction that in the last 15 or so years, that human cry is now, is now out to the public. And people know about it for the first time. Okay, oh, let, let, one more introductory <laughs> remark before we get to this. Um, there's about 30,000 works of art that have been uncovered since World War II. About 30,000. And they're still being uncovered. They're still being found. They are housed literally throughout the world. But about 30,000 works of art that have been discovered, uncovered, whatever word you want to use, since World War II. But that's about one-tenth of the works that were created during the war. So it, when, you know, when you talk to these artists, they say that they saved maybe five works that they may have created, may have drawn 50 works of art or so. So it's, it's all approximate, obviously, but about 30,000 works of art have now been discovered. We know where they are. They're at the museums in Europe, especially at the concentration camps. The largest collections are in Auschwitz, Auschwitz-Birkenau, outside of Krakow in Poland. Um, Buchenwald has a very large selection in, in Germany. Um, and at Yad Vashem, which is the Israeli Holocaust State Memorial and Museum in Jerusalem. So those are the main depositories. There's a pretty good collection also at the Museum of Washington, D.C. Okay, so let's start with um, the first one. And, the, and this is, the artist is Felix Nussbaum. Felix Nussbaum is a German Jew. And this work is arguably, although there's very little argument actually, this is the most important work of Holocaust art. Felix Nussbaum did this work not in the ghettos or camps, even though I told you most of what I will show tonight was there, but he did this in hiding. He's a German Jew. He and his wife are both artists. His wife is named Falke. They go into hiding in Brussels, in Belgium. They are caught in Belgium and incarcerated at a camp, a transit camp, it's called, in southwestern France. It's called Gers. He escapes, he and his wife, escape Gers, go back into hiding in Belgium, and he does remarkable works of art. This is, again, his most famous work, and it shows Felix Nussmann, it's a self-portrait. So it shows this man, and I don't know if you can look at, see his identity card, but it's, marked, it's in French, because he's in Belgium, but it's marked Jew. And he has, of course, the Star of David, the Jewish Star of David, on his coat lapel. And we, we, we know that he's in hiding. We know he's not standing outside creating this work of art. But it's such an important work of art because it shows what is going through his mind, psychologically, perhaps spiritually as well. And it's an interesting piece because it shows the fear. It shows the walls boxed in. I mean, he's boxed in by the walls behind him with a very dark uh, motif on the top and everything else. But yet, look at his face. And it's a work of defiance. It's, it's a work not just of fear and trepidation. It's a work of this is who I am. I am the hunted Jew, but I am a man nonetheless. What's interesting about Nussbaum, and I'll show you some works of his a little bit later, that Nussbaum is, is an assimilated German Jew. A lot of German Jews were very assimilated into German society. He didn't think of himself as a Jew. He thought of himself as a German first and a Jew secondly. But he knows that he is defined by his religion, whether he's religious or not. And that's what it's about. But I'll, I'll talk about him a little bit more as we go along. All right, the second one is done by a man named Peter Edel, also a German Jew. Not all these are done by Jewish artists, certainly. And the artists are from all over Europe. And so I'm trying to just give you a smattering as much as I can. But Peter Edel does this work, and it's a self-portrait. He's also in Auschwitz. And what we see is the Peter Edel on the right-hand side, the man that he was, relatively young man, professional man, well-dressed, and the man on the left is the man he's become. And what it says, it's in German, there's some words there in German, and what it says is, who is this? You, me, yes. And then it's signed by Peter Edel, 1944. And we know it's Auschwitz because it, you can see the Nacht Frei. It's supposed to, the whole thing is Arbeit not Frei, which mean, which translates to work brings freedom, which was the entrance to Auschwitz. Uh, excuse me, uh, 
Yeah, Auschwitz, right? Not working on Auschwitz. But anyway, you can see the knock pride. But again, it's a psychological state. It's not just the physical devastation that people are trying to portray. It's a psychological as well. Uh, this doesn't look like much, but it's an incredible piece. Uh, it's done by a Polish artist named Helena Olamuki, and it's called Self-Portrait After Four Selections. Self-Portrait After Four Selections. It's actually done on, with pencil on tattered yellow paper. So I know it doesn't look like much up there, but it's incredible to see it in Poland. And what it is, again, it's a psychological study. What happens to an individual once they go through selections? Yes, they perhaps can survive the selection, but what happens psychologically? So it's a self-portrait after four selections. And we can see the trembling hand. We can literally see it in her work. Uh, this is done on the back of a shoebox, on the back of a shoebox, which is the only thing this artist could find. Her name is Lea Lillian Bloom. She's also a Polish. And it's um, a portrait of a famous Yiddish poet. His name is Yitzhak Katznelson. And Katznelson wasn't that old and certainly didn't look like that when he went into the camps. But she tried to portray what happened, what was happening to this man. And there was a term for this in the camps. And it was called, they called people like this, people that had just been borne down, had been beaten down psychologically, physically, every which way. They called them Muslimen. And they called them Muslimen because they thought of Muslims. When Muslims pray, they lay prostrate on the ground. And that's how they depicted these people. They, they, they would literally just fall down and die. Now, he's not quite there yet, but he's certainly close. And he does die in Auschwitz. Uh, a lot of portraits, of course, of children. This is a portrait of a, a boy named Yannick. He's 15 years old. And I like this portrait a lot because every one of the portraits done by this artist, the eyes are always the same. Doesn't matter what their facial expression is. Doesn't matter what their age. It, the eyes are always the same. And the artist describes it. He says that the eyes are horrifyingly strange, but in each one lurks the egoistic urge to survive. And again, this is a 15-year-old boy who obviously, just by the look on his face, has seen way, way too much. Uh, this is another one that I love. But it's uh, called The Fortune Teller. It's by, done by Frederick Frita in Theresien. Um, the German's called Theresienstadt. Theresien is in what was Czechoslovakia, now, of course, the Czech Republic. But we have an elderly woman interned at Theresien, and she has, as you can see, or hopefully you can see, can you see the cards on the table? Okay, it's pretty clear. Anyway, so she tells the fortune. People come to her and they ask their, their fortune. Now, what do you think their fortune is? I think we know, right? And we know her fortune too. We know her fortune as an elderly person in the camps. She slated, and she slated for death. They're all slated for death, but she's going to be one of the first to go. So we know that because we see if you can go up on the, on the left-hand side, you can see the entrance to the crematorium. Uh, Dina Gottliebova was a um, young art student from Czechoslovakia, interned at Auschwitz. And she survives literally by her skill that Dr. Mengele notices. Dr. Joseph Mengele, the SS, the premier SS doctor, you probably heard of him. Um, he was a lover of art. And he came upon this, she was a girl, she was 14 years old, again, an art student. And he came upon her one day drawing a portrait of another, another prisoner. And he said, you will work for me. And what he did, he appointed, he didn't give her a choice, of course. She worked for him by doing portraits of gypsy women. Gypsy women. And she did 12 portraits of various gypsy women in the camps. Seven of those portraits, it's pretty good numbers, seven of the 12 have survived. What Mengele was doing, he was doing a study. Mengele was a very bright man, a very evil man, but very bright nonetheless. And he would do studies of what he called the mongrelized races. The mongrelized races of Europe were the Jews and the gypsies. But 
You can look at this. Does this look like a person of a mongrelized race? Dina Gottliebova, at the age of 14, was incredibly courageous because she painted, this is a painting, by the way, she painted these women as they were, not as Mengele wanted them or thought them to be. So what I see, you may see something different, but I see incredible beauty, and I see courage, and I see dignity. This woman, which I found out a lot later from the artist, this woman just watched her baby being murdered. She just watched her baby being murdered, and they told her, please sit for me. The artist told her, please sit for me. I will keep you alive. And she kept her alive during the creation of the work of art for about two weeks. After the two weeks, this woman, she's from France, by the way, was sent to the gas chambers. The second one, and remember I said there's seven, but I'm just showing you two, because to me it's a good contrast. This is an older, not an elderly, but an older, she happens to be a Polish gypsy. And again, I see incredible defiance on her face. And it's amazing, these works, that Mengele allowed them to at least exist. There's a major lawsuit between the artist, Dina Gottliebova. She's taken off the OVA, because now she lives in the United States. So now her name's Dina Gottlieb and the Auschwitz Museum. The museum has the seven works of art. Dina Gottlieb wants those works of art, which she created at the risk of losing her life. And they've been battling for the last 10 years. As far as I know, the artist has not won yet. Now, the museum claims, of course, that that's where they were created and people will see them when they go to the Auschwitz Museum. So I'm not saying that they're callous, although obviously I would prefer that the artist get those paintings back. Uh, we're going to switch to the um, camp at uh, Theresien. It's called Theresien in Czech, Theresienstadt in German. This is, again, outside of Prague, about an hour or so outside of Prague. This is a very unique place. There were hundreds and hundreds of concentration camps, as you probably know, in Europe during the Second World War. Theresien was unique. It was the, what called the model ghetto. This was the one camp slash ghetto that the Nazis would eventually allow the International Red Cross to come in. This was a garrison town built during the time of Maria Theresien back in the late 1800s. So there were brick buildings here, unlike, of course, the other camps in which there were just wood. But there were brick buildings, and what was unique about this is they decided that they would have this ghetto and try to ensure the world that what they, they, the Nazis, were doing and their accomplices were doing wasn't so bad. So they had this ghetto, and they tried to make it look as good as it could, and they employed artists. They actually had artists working in the technical drawing studio. There are a number of very prominent Jewish, there are only Jews incarcerated there, by the way, Jews from Czechoslovakia, but from other parts of Europe, that they had them work in a studio. It's called a technical drawing studio during the day to make charts and graphs and things like that for the Nazis themselves. But what they would do is they would take, they had supplies, of course, right? And they took the supplies back to their barracks at night. And literally, sometimes, in the middle of night, with very little light or no light at all, at least one artist said they had no light except the stars and the moon, they created these clandestine works of art. And they are phenomenal. They are truly unbelievable. This one's called Film and Reality. Because what happens is, in December of 1944, the Nazis allow the International Red Cross to come into Theresien. It's the only camp that the Red Cross was allowed into. There's four people from the Red Cross, three from Denmark, one from uh, Switzerland, not Switzerland, France, I think. But four people come in there, and th the head of this camp wants to have a film ready for them, a propaganda film. The film is called, and, and parts of this exist, by the way, I have it, but the film is called The Town that the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler, gave to the Jews. The town, this magnanimous man, gave to the Jews of Europe in the midst of war. And so this is called film and reality. And all the actors and actresses in the film 
are prisoners. The director of the film is a prisoner as well. Everybody in the film is a prisoner. They are promised if they participate in making this film, this propaganda film, they will not be shipped to Auschwitz or any of the other death camps. So the, working on the film meant life. It was a lie, as everything, just about everything was. They did stay alive while they worked on it, of course. After the film was completed, they were shipped, almost every one of them, including this very famous director named Kurt Garon. But anyway, this one's called Film and Reality. So we see this elderly Jewish man and the uh, robot, if you will, is applying with the Jewish star, the star of David. She's applying makeup to him. That's really going to help, right? And we see, of course, the, the um, projector with the boots of a stormtrooper. Um, the film, by the way, was not made on time. <laughs> Although they tried to get it on time for the visit, it wasn't made on time. The film was finally made. There's about 10 minutes of it that exist today. So you, you can, I can show it to you if you want. But it's really interesting. And of course, it makes Therese look like not quite a spa, but not too terribly far from it. Uh, they had shops created in Theresien. Because remember, this is a town that Fuhrer gave to the Jews. So we have Elevensbittel, which is food shop, Parfumery, which is perfume shop, cosmetic shop. So two shops. But what the artists are trying to tell the Red Cross, and they do smuggle some of these drawings out to the Red Cross, because of course they're not allowed to give it to them. But we see death, of course, all around them. These are false facades. You see the eyes on top of the two buildings? The eyes, of course, tell the truth. Uh, there's a band, the place for the Red Cross visitors. They actually had a band in, in Trazen, and they're called the Ghetto Swingers. And actually, I was really lucky. In Miami, I met a man that played in the band, and he told me they played jazz music. Isn't that incredible? That they played jazz music. We know that, that, pe that African Americans, blacks, were verboten to the Nazis, right? That they, these Jews played African-American jazz music in a concentration camp. It's remarkable. And, and he's it, telling me the things that they played. Because they had listened to jazz. I mean, this is, we're talking, of course, about the 1940s. Some of them had traveled, and they had listened to jazz music even in the midst of the war, and they could play it. But, of course, what's really going on is death. Because, again, the symbol of the hearse is a constant, constant metaphor in almost all these works. And you can see the Star of David on top of the hearse. Uh, they had a cafe. Remember, this is a nice town. So you can see what a great time they're having in the cafe. I don't think so, right? What you see is elderly people, most of them are bandaged. Tells you the force was needed to get them to come to be part of this cafe. And so, and maybe you can't tell, but there's nothing in the glasses whatsoever. You have a waitress there, and the waitress is really interesting. Because you notice her dress, the top of her dress? It's kind of low cut, isn't it? So why did the artist do that? Well, to show her dried up breast. To show what was really going on. No one is conversing. They're hardly having a wonderful time. But there was a cafe. There was a bank and everything else. Uh, the artist again tried to explain through their work what was really going on in Theresen. And what was going on in Theresen is that people were dying in droves. There are about 150,000 Jewish men, women, and children interned at Theresen for the four years from 41 to 1945, around 150,000. 33,000 of those 150 died of malnutrition, beatings, starvation, being worked to death, etc. 33,000 died in the camp itself. Another 87,000, another 87,000 of those 150 that passed through Theresen were sent to their death in Auschwitz. Okay? So I know you're all great mathematicians like my students, Larry. Just like my students. So I ask them to add 87 and 33. And they come up with a number. There are not many people left. When the Soviets liberate Theresen, this wonderful spa town that Hitler gave to the Jews, there's less than 20,000 human beings still alive. And so this work by Leo Haas shows the constant hunger and a second work by the same artist. Again, all their bowls are empty. And who are they appealing to? They're appealing to us. They're appealing to the world. 
these works were smuggled out by an incredibly courageous man who was later found and beaten. And each of the artists who created these works of art were also found um, a great story, which is hard to believe, but it, I, I think it's true, is that um, Adolf Eichmann came to the camp. Eichmann was not in Theresien, but he actually came to the camp, interrogated the four artists who did the works that I showed you, and he said, how could you do this when Hitler gave you such a wonderful town? And what he did is he broke their hands, he and other people, they broke their hands, they put them into the, the little fortress, which was a prison at Theresien, and sent them and their families, not just the artists, sent them and their families to Auschwitz. One of the four, one of the four, he and his wife survived. Uh, a lot of us know of Theresien through the children's art. This is very, very famous. And there's a, a book, which some of you, maybe all of you are familiar with. It's called I Never Saw Another Butterfly. And it's the children's art and poetry that the children wrote. And the butterfly theme is a constant one in which they worked on. There was a woman named Frieda Dicker Brandeis from the Bauhaus, believe it or not. A Jewish woman, artist from the Bauhaus, that was interned at Theresien. She taught art classes. And the Nazis allowed her to have art classes for children under the age of 14, who, of course, would all be sent to the gas chamber eventually. But while they were in Theresien, they created, believe it or not, about 4,000 works of art. About 4,000 works of art. Almost every one survived. Not the children. Out of the children, there's about 15,000 children in Theresien under the age of 14. 100, about 100, survived. Out of 15,000, about 100 survived. This is one, her name, this girl did not survive, but her name is Eva Berlova, who did this work. Uh, Theresien was a remarkable place in many respects because the Nazis allowed the Jewish prisoners to have cultural events because they thought if they could keep them at least satisfied culturally and intellectually, they would not rebel. They wouldn't be a problem. So they had theatrical performances. They had poetry readings. There were operas. I mean, it was incredible. There were operas written in Theresien. One of the operas, it's called The Emperor of Atlantis, was performed for the first time about three years ago in Miami. Luckily, I was there when it was performed. It's incredible. It was written in that camp, never performed there. There was a children's opera called Brundabar that they had several performances. And again, everybody that was in the opera was promised that they would live. The opera was performed. Then they were sent to their death. Um, one of the artists, this is a gift to his son. His son, Tommy, is going to celebrate, if you can use that word very loosely, his fourth birthday. So the artist creates a book for his son, Tomas, Tommy. And this is at the cover of the book. And it shows young Tommy looking out the window at the freedom, which most likely is a very good chance he will never experience. The rest of the book, which I won't show you the rest, but the rest is the things that Tommy thinks he may one day partake in. One of the things that he might go into, like being a fireman, a policeman, or something like that. The remarkable thing is his parents did not survive. They were murdered in Auschwitz. But this little boy did survive. And um, I had the privilege of meeting him. So his name is Thomas Frita. He was adopted by one of the other artists and his wife. The one artist that I mentioned survived, Leo Haas. This boy was adopted by he and his wife. And uh, what's interesting is this boy said he was never religious at all, that he was appointed to head of the Jewish council. Probably a very astute move in Prague. And he became, he didn't become religious but he became, as he said, a good person when he was appointed. So that's how he ended up, Thomas Frita at age four in the book. Um, the transport theme is very popular in Holocaust art. This is a remarkable story. It's of a, a man named Yamas Korzik. And Yamas Korzik was head of the orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. Head of the orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. Dr. Korzik was a very, very well-known and highly respected educator. He was Jewish, but people in Poland and even the Germans 
respected him for what he had accomplished in life. They went to his orphanage one day in, War- in the Warsaw Ghetto and they told Dr. Korzik that they were going to take the children to the ghetto railway station and then to Treblinka. Take the children and the staff that he could stay. He could live. And Dr. Korzik said, where the children go, so will I. And he went with them. And it, sh- excuse me, it shows his journey to the ghetto railway station and then to Treblinka. Um, fear of deportation was a constant in every person who was incarcerated in the ghettos, especially the concentration camps. And one woman who did this pretty simple work was named Charlotte Brasova. She was quite young, about 17 years old at the time. Unfortunately, I don't have another work that she did, but her story is pretty remarkable. It shows, again, the fear that people had that she does a drawing and an SS officer comes up to her and he says, I want you to do a drawing of the Madonna, or painting, excuse me, not a drawing, a painting of the Madonna for my wife as a birthday present. So he tells this prisoner she's going to do that. She does it. What she does, however, she does paint the Madonna for his wife's birthday present, but she puts a tear in her eye. And believe it or not, this is what this woman told me, I believe it to be true, is this SS officer was so touched by that. He said, never complete the painting. I will keep you alive as long as you keep on working on it. And she survived that way. She lives in Prague. So remarkable stories. Um, Again, transport theme is always there. You see their stoop posture. People, you know, they say, did they know where they were going? Well, yes and no. For a certain point in the war, people in the camps understood that if they were going to be deported from a transit camp or a concentration camp, it would usually mean death. Because especially if they got on the train and it started going east, they knew it was going to end up in one of the six death camps in Poland. And we also know that the Nazis used cattle cars, literally cattle cars. And, um, and this scene just shows us what it was like. About 100 to 120 people were literally crammed into one of these cars. Sometimes the cars would be en route for three or four days and nights. Uh, the only food or water was what they took with them. Of course, there was no hygiene in the cattle car at all. And as we know, just from memoirs and everything else, when they opened up the cars, depending on what time of the year it was and how many days they were on the car or in the car, there would be corpses coming out. So they were taking the people out of the cattle car and, of course, taking the corpses out as well. Uh, just one work that tries to illustrate what it must have been like in those cars. Again, not physically so much, but psychologically. What was going on? Just the incredible terror that people had. Um, life in the camps, and depending on which camp, of course, was obviously very, very difficult. And w- we think of them, when you go to these camps, they talk about bunk beds. But... The prisoners didn't call them bunk beds. They called them boxes. Because these are not bunk beds. These are boxes in which you have, you can't sleep lengthwise, you have to sleep sideways. And as we know from Ellie Rizal's work and others, there's usually about five or six prisoners in one of those boxes. And again, you can see how emaciated they are. They're really, they're walking skeletons. This was done at Buchenwald. Each of the camps had orchestras. And the orchestras were very important. They would play for the incoming uh, arrivals. They would play for the people getting off the cattle cart as they marched them into the, quote, showers, which were gas chambers. They would play very nice music, polka music, upbeat music for the people so they would think that things are not going to be so bad. They're going to, they were told they're going to take showers because they had a long trip and they were dirty and everything else. So they would play for those people. They would play for the enjoyment of the Nazis as well. There are a number of people that literally stayed alive by their artistic um, ability, by their artistic skill. Uh, Auschwitz actually had four orchestras. Such a large camp, it had four full orchestras, all made up of prisoner musicians. Um, work details. Trying to explain what work was if you were incarcerated in one of the camps. So this artist does his best. 
These are five human beings. They are hitched together. They look like oxen, don't they? Which is at least what he wants them to look like. And so they're treated like animals. They're hitched together, maybe not literally, but certainly symbolically. And we see this incredibly large roller in the background. So we know that if they, you know, they're emaciated, they're weak and everything else, if they fall down, we know exactly what's going to happen. Work details were very, very strict and very rigorous. If you were sent to, for instance, Mauthausen, which was a camp in Austria, the average length of life in Mauthausen was one week. It's not that they shot you. It's not that they gassed you. It's that they worked you to death. Literally worked you to death. The average length of life in Mauthausen and other camps, not all camps, but at least in that one, was one week. Uh, there's an artist named Joseph Shina who did a, a work. It's actually done in, in Auschwitz. It's in Block 11. And this is in homage to 168 art students, art students that were rounded up in Krakow, the Krakow Art Academy. They were rounded up because they were artists and they were doing some clandestine works of art, some anti-Nazi works of art. So they were rounded up. That's their teacher right in the middle. Each one was sent to Block 11. They weren't gassed. They weren't Jews, by the way. They weren't gassed. They were put in Block 11 and shot one by one. And we know about the uh, roll calls. And the roll calls would vary at different camps, but they would usually start at 4 or 4.30 in the morning. There would be several roll calls during the day. Um, at one point in Auschwitz, and it happened in Theresien at well, there was a roll call that began at 5 a.m. and lasted till midnight. The prisoners had to stand there at attention, 5 a.m. to midnight. What happens to you if you're, first of all, incredibly malnourished, weak to begin with? Most likely people were collapsing, which of course they were. As soon as they collapsed, they would be kicked, some would be shot, and some would be hanged. And what they what the Nazis loved doing is when they would have these public hangings, they would parade the prisoners. Prisoners always talk about this. They would parade the prisoners around to see their comrades hanging from the gallows. Uh, two works, this one and the next one, done by a, an artist named Waldemar Nowakowski. Nowakowski was a, was a Christian Pole, and he was very lucky because he had access to all parts of the camp. He did this work on the size of a postcard. So think of that. I'm not an artist, but that takes a lot of skill, to say the least. This is done on the size. It's done on a postcard. This one is called The Jew's Last Road. And this one, simply called Nazi and Child. To remind us again what's going on, it's not just mass murder. But in fact, it is humiliation. It is torture. It is, in fact, taking a child by his or her hair picking them up in front of their mother, most likely, and then, of course, shooting them. A million and a half children were murdered in those camps during World War II. One child that did survive, she was one of those 100 that I mentioned before from Therese, and she's become a very good friend. Um, her name is Helga Wysova, and she's 12 years old, and she does this work. A lot of the children do work to remind them of happy times. So like the butterflies that I mentioned before. So a lot of the work is, again, rem reminders of childhood when they were free and they were happy. Helga Wysova, at the age of 12 and 13, she draws what she sees. And what she sees is, of course, death and destitute and destruction all around her. This is simply called suicide on the wire. Uh, this doesn't look like much, but it's a remarkable work. It's carved out of concrete. Um, at Maidonic. And what does it look like? What kind of animal? Excuse me? Yeah, exactly. A turtle. It's a tortoise. And the turtle probably means very little to us, but if you were Polish, it would mean a lot to you. Maybe some of you are Polish. It's a symbol of resistance. It's a symbol of resistance. A prisoner named Alban Bonecki carves this tortoise, turtle, call it what you want, out of concrete. Takes him years. Carves this with some help from other prisoners. And it, you can, if you ever go to Medonic outside of Lublin, you can see it. Not only did this survive, but that man escaped Medonic and he survived and came to the United States. 
This is a very surrealistic work, very different than all the others. I don't know what to make of it, but I like showing it because it's so different. It's done by a, an architect named Norbert Troller in Theresen. And the reason I like it is that prisoners have said, and, and the literature tells us, that people didn't dream. That if you're in one of these camps, that everything in your world was so nightmarish that you couldn't even dream. You just collapsed at night. If you're lucky enough, you got up the next morning. Well, Troller evidently had some dreams. And this is one of them. It's called Nightmare. So we know what he was dreaming about. It's an interesting piece. It looks like Jacob's Ladder from the Bible. So you see these people. You can see human figures. There's a man on top, on the top bunk or box, whatever you want to call it. And I love it because you have this angel. This angel. And the angel has... She's pretty... Um, it's pretty sensuous. <laughs> okay, so what, we don't know what he was dreaming of. Something alluring about this angel. Uh, this is three works by, maybe three or four, by Felix Nussbaum. He's the artist that we started with. Uh, these works, again, are done in hiding. So they're different from the others, of course. But Nussbaum does these remarkable works. This is done in 1943, and it's called The Argon Grinder. This becomes Felix Nussbaum's alter ego. So you have the organ grinder right in the middle and you see the devastation, the destruction of Europe all around him. This is Felix Nussbaum, self-portraited easel. And so he's a warrior. And what are his weapons? Paintbrush, right? Paintbrush and easel. But his weapons are his humanity. That's what it is. It's a, it's a work of defiance. This is what he is. And he is a symbol of civilized humanity. And he will fight the dehumanization as much as he can, and as courageously as he can. Um, he's going to lose that fight because this is one of his last works, not his last one, but this is called um, The Damned. And what you have is 12 people in here. They're all Jews in hiding in Brussels. Um, the 12 people represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Felix Nussbaum is the man with the beret. So he puts himself and his wife, Elka, is just to his left. So the two of those are of the dams. He knows that his time is going to be numbered. What's really remarkable about this work is that there's actually two, two coffins. You see one. What you can't see is a number. Each of the coffins are numbered. And the numbers are 25,670, something like that. But he's actually trying to figure out how many Jews are hiding in Belgium and most likely will be found. And remarkably, he's almost on target. Almost on target. And his last work, which Anne Canfield knows, because she put it on the website, is called The Death of Dance. And this is a, just a, a stunning work. It's a very large work. Remember, he's in an attic, so he's not in the camp. He's, he doesn't need to hide it. And again, you have um, the organ grinder in the middle. And you have these skeletons all around them playing the music of death. What's really interesting is this is his last work. It's done, completed one week, one week after he's captured. He and his wife are captured one week after this, sent to their death. They are, they are killed almost immediately once they arrive at Auschwitz. But what's interesting is you got the organ... Uh, wait, is this going to work? Can you see red there? <laughs> I can see it there, but now I can't. See. Oh, I guess it doesn't work on a TV. Sorry about that. But just to the right of the organ grinder, there's a very small figure, and it's a man on horseback. You may or may not be able to see it. Just to the right of the organ grinder, and that one small figure, which most people miss, of course, on horseback, is the slim chance, slim chance that he and his wife will escape. That is, does not happen. Uh, as I say, they are caught and murdered in Auschwitz. However, there is a, he's from a town in, in Germany called Onsdenbruck. And believe it or not, the town of Onsdenbruck, Germany, created a museum to Felix Nussbaum and his work. And most of his work has survived. And it's in the museum. The museum is remarkable. It's designed by uh, Daniel Liebeskin. And Daniel Liebeskin is a Jewish man who designed the Jewish Museum in Berlin and also won the competition for the memorial in New York City. For the, um, what, what do you call that? The, what was it? The Twin Tower Memorial in New York City. 
So there's a lot of comparisons going on. Uh, I'm pretty close to ending, but, but not quite there. I'm going a little, a little bit longer. But there are a couple of works, well, there are a lot of works. I'm going to just show you two that shows um, pious Jews praying. And, of course, they didn't have a temple, obviously. They didn't have a synagogue, but they, had, they did what they could. If they could bring in their prayer shawls, some of them smuggled in Torahs. And this is called Reading the Torah on the Sabbath in Therese's. And the second one, this is by Nussbaum. I like this one a lot because, it gets, again, it shows these people they're in their prayer shawls, so we know they're Orthodox Jews, they're religious Jews. They're going to pray. Nussbaum is the one on the right, and he's not a pious Jew. He's not an Orthodox Jew, that's for sure. But he puts on a prayer shawl, at least symbolically, and does this drawing. And, again, they're going to this makeshift synagogue. There's three works done by a boy that will look like nothing I know. And people say, why would I show these? But these are remarkable works. Because these three works, this one and the next two, were part of the trial, the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt, Germany in 1955. When the Nazi, um, when, when the Nazi soldiers, well actually their leaders, were saying that they didn't have gas chambers, they didn't cream, cremate anyone, they didn't burn anyone, this boy got up and he said, I have drawings that I made while I was there. This boy was in a work detail. Again, he was a very young boy, and his work detail was to take the ashes out of the crematorium, to take the ashes and bury them or put them in the river. So that, that's, he saw everything. And this is the disrobing room at Auschwitz. This is his little drawing of the gas chamber which, of course, was meant to look like a shower, did look like a shower. And then finally, taking the corpses, distangling the corpses from the gas chamber next door to the crematorium. And two works that actually try to depict what was going on in the gas chamber. Um, this is difficult, obviously, because very few people survived. There's one known survivor of the gas chamber. But this is a man that worked in the Zonder Commando, the Zonder Commander was a Jewish work detail that went in and distangled the bodies. So he actually went into the gas chamber after the people were dead, took the bodies, took them to the crematorium. Anyway, this shows again the gas chamber, how people are just tangling. They're all on top of one another because the pellets were dropped in from the ceiling but went to the ground. And so people tried to get up as high as they could just to breathe another moment. And there's always, there, there is, it's important because there is a window. There was always a window that a, a Nazi SS officer could look to see what was happening. And this is done by a Soviet soldier artist named Zinovi Tokachev. This is done when he and his fellow soldiers liberate Maidanik in July of 44 and Auschwitz in January 1945. So he is, has never seen anyone being gassed, but he tries to imagine how that must have happened. And so you see these two girls, and the it is a red ribbon, uh, excuse me, a red flower that the girl on your right is holding, and it mirrors the saliva coming out of the mouth of the other girl. And of course, after being gassed, they would go to the crematorium. So we have a number of works that show that. Um, we think of liberation as a happy time and, and again, prisoners talk about it as this one glorious moment in their existence during World War II. But we need to understand that liberation wasn't quite that way. Because when the troops went in there, as I mentioned right at the start of my talk, mostly what they saw was corpses. They saw dying people and the death. And so we have one artist, this is done in Dachau, and so what he first says is the prisoners, when they were actually liberated, they made these makeshift coffins. And they would put not one body in a coffin, but usually two or three, because there were so many bodies that they had to bury. But after a while, they just laid them on the ground. It was just too many. They didn't have enough wood, so the bodies would just be there. And that's what the soldiers saw. That's what the American, Soviet, and British soldiers saw when they came in. One work done after the war, trying to depict those final days in Buchenwald, 
Uh, it's a very large work by a Russian artist, Boris Teslitsky. And again, our conception of liberation is not quite the way it was. I like this work a lot because it shows these people are now liberated. They're behind barbed wire that they've been told that they're free. But look at them. You don't quite see jubilation. And the truth is that when you talk to survivors, they tell you that freedom wasn't part of their vocabulary. They were told in their native language that they were free. But after months and years for some of them, some of them were there for four, five years, that word meant nothing to them. So you can see, you see hopefulness perhaps, but what you really see is anxiety on their faces, which I suggest was exactly what was there. Okay, some final works by Tolkachev, the Soviet soldier artist. Uh, he's in the liberation, as I said before. So this is a self-congratulatory work. The Soviet soldier coming in, the children coming up to him, and it's called the liberator. But then he's also very honest because what he really sees is children, if they were lucky enough to survive, and that was rare, they would be looking for their family members. And usually what they would see is their corpses. And then you have three women, and the one is looking down, the one on your right is looking down at the bones, most likely of her family members. The woman on the left is weeping, and the third woman in the middle is looking directly at us and wondering how in the heck this could have happened. And then my second to last work, I used to end with this, but now I'm going to end with one other, is uh, also done by Tolkachov, and it shows a um, Jewish prayer shawl that's called a talit, and the talit is caught on the barbed wire fence. But I like this one a lot because there's no human beings in it, obviously. It just shows the scorched earth. And what it represents, of course, is the scorched earth, not only on the surface of the earth, but inside the soul of each of us. That's what the Holocaust was about. But my final work um, is done after liberation. It's done by a Jewish survivor of Auschwitz and other camps. And, of course, you have the symbol of resistance, so you have the outstretched arm. But you also see the fingers. And I don't know, anybody know Hebrew here? I'm not much of a Hebrew scholar, but I can tell you what, those, what they mean. There's two Jewish words there. And the words are Baruch. Every Jewish prayer begins with the word Baruch, and that means bless. And the second word is Hashem. God does not have a name in Judaism, so God is called many things. Adonai is one. It's very common. Hashem actually means the name. It's, it's one word, H-A-S-H-E-M. It means the name of God. God does not have a name, but it means the name of God. So literally it says, bless the name of God. And um, perhaps it means bless the name of God that we have survived. That's it. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Please. Uh, yeah. The, uh, was there much art retrieved from the Soviets like this? Yes. Was it, yeah. Did they share with us? Now. <laughs> since, the, yeah, since the fall. Yeah. And it's a good, very good question. You, we're going back to what? 1989, 1990. So, yeah, some of it. A, a lot of it was in, uh, there's a Jewish historical society in Warsaw. Now, again, Poland, of course, was part of the Soviet sphere and under Soviet influence, but after 1990, scholars from the West could go over there and see the work. So yes, it's now available. Hmm. Yeah, because it's it's really important because the Soviets are the ones who liberated a lot of those. Remember the camp, the death camps are all up in Poland, and it's the Soviets, not the Americans. We liberated Buchenwald, Dachau, but we were coming in from the West. They were coming in from the East. They're the ones that liberated the death camps. Some of the death camps are already closed. Like Sobibor was in 1943. There was a revolt, and it was leveled. That Maidanik and Auschwitz, um, the Soviets liberated. So, yeah, they did have a lot of them. Yes, please. Well, thank you for that. I, I, that was extraordinary. Oh, thank you. I brought a little show and tell. This Terrific. Is, Wonderful. This is a menorah that was a gift to me from my parents who live in Maryland. And it's by a, a man named Erwin Teberger. Do you know that name? I don't. Who, this is my, the story that my parents tell me, that he's, he was in Auschwitz and survived. Uh-huh. Um, 
And when he was in the camps, he would make menorahs. Menorahs, the candle that are used in Hanukkah, for those of you who don't know, had of scraps of metal. And he continued the tradition when he was free. Um, and apparently, according to my parents, he has, a, he has one of his menorahs on display in the White House. That's wonderful. So, uh, thank, thank you for sharing that. Sure. Mm-hmm. And where was he from? The way I, I wish I knew the full okay. story of his life. I actually tried to go and find something online uh-huh. right before coming over here, and I was huh. surprised that I, okay. I couldn't find Francis, I mean, you could, if you wanted to, you could email Yad Vashem, for example, give them his name, and yeah. they may have some bi- biographical yeah. information that you could get. Thank you for sharing that. Anything else? What about the art family? You said it was in hiding and they did it. Yeah. Well, a lot of it was hid in the camps themselves. I'll tell you just a really quick story about it. And I, I give three examples how it's hidden. Um, it's raised in the head brick barracks. So the prisoner, I mean, they're very ingenious, of course. All of us are. They literally, threw, they had spoons and they dug into the bricks. They would take out the brick remove the brick, put the work of art in the wall, and put the brick back. And most of those works did survive. And then other times they would try to smuggle them out of the camp. Because you know, a lot of prisoners went out of the camps to work details. And they would see the local populace. And one artist said it was very simple. He simply put it, the work in his pants and it was a nice Polish man, a very courageous Polish man. He would give them to this Christian bowl and that person would keep them farmed. But the best story is, this is a remarkable story done by, um, it's by this one artist that I showed before. His name is, name is Zoran Yusitz. That he went into the, the library at Dachau. The library is in almost every camp. He actually went into the Dachau library one day and found a copy of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. Okay? Now this Jewish man is not going to read Mein Kampf. That I can assure you. But he took a chance. He tore out every page of Hitler's Mein Kampf, his story is anti-Semitic diatribe, took out every page, hid his drawings in the covers of Mein Kampf, and luckily, no one went to read that damn book. <laughs> and it's, I mean, isn't that poetic justice <laughs> to put it in Hitler's, again, anti-Semitic spewing, and it survived. I mean, remarkable story. And you listen to these stories and you say, can you know, can you believe it? But the more you read about the Holocaust, the whole thing's unbelievable. I mean, to deny the reality of irrationality doesn't make sense because the whole thing's irrational. This one survivor said something very simple, which I always tell my students. She says, the Holocaust is shrouded in ambiguity. And just when you think you understand it, you better think again. There are so many things which will never make sense. So, why not? Why not go to my account of occupations? Germans, the Germans, the guards, and so on. Right. How many ordinary people didn't? Right. Yeah, it's a good point. Well, yeah, the Germans, Nazis, and their accomplices. Because, in fact, a lot of the Jews were rounded up initially by not the German Nazis, but by Nazis or Nazi sympathizers in their own country. Like the Double cross in Hungary, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Mass psychology works. And propaganda, years and years of propaganda. And if you look at the children's books that were created in Nazi Germany from the early 1920s to 1933, you begin to understand how hatred can live a very fertile life. If you just water it, you know, the, the hatred and the prejudice is there. All you got to do is nurture it. Because and we, it's the solution to all their problems. Exactly, that's right. Sure. Yeah. And why not? You know, and Hitler was more obsessed, <laughs> we know that Adolf Hitler was more obsessed from his words with killing the Jews than he was defeating the Allied powers. His last words, supposedly, none of us were there, supposedly, did we kill all the Jews? He didn't say, did we, did we defeat the Americans? Did we defeat the Brits? Did we defeat those damn Russians? He said, did we kill the Jews? And he stepped up the killing of the Jews when it was getting closer. Absolutely. Closer. Right. Good point. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, the Hungarian Jews, about 440,000, were rounded up in the summer of 1944 when he, was all, he 
and of course the troops were already losing the war. But you can see that was just a general Right, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yes. One question on the uh, that Polish Christian gentleman. Uh huh. We got that drawing, those drawings. Uh huh. What did he do and his fellow townsmen after they interpreted the drawings? Right. That's a extremely good question. And they just yeah. And try for what? I don't know. It, it's a good question. And they smuggled those drawings out to tell the world what was happening. That most presidents would tell you. The world didn't seem to care very much, um, including the United States government, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. The whole story about Roosevelt is, we don't need to go in here, but Roosevelt was a great man that knew about the concentration of death camps and did very little. Yeah. When you see this, never letting yourself go, you mm -hmm. know, to the dark side, to not give up hope, to still right. keep believing mm -hmm. that somehow, some way, in spite of what was all around us, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You have that hope to, to want to keep going on, to let people know. Right. Yeah, good point. It's Very good point, Ruth. I mean, absolutely exactly. amazing. Yeah. You know, I look at myself and in this world that I live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. This, doing these works of art, they all said the same thing. Sounds trite, but extremely meaningful. It gave them life. It gave them purpose. Because you're right, if you're in those camps and you're degraded every day, humiliated every day, of course people gave up. Suicide was rampant. And if it wasn't suicide, it was just literally giving up on life before your life was taken. And that's what they said. To create a work of art was life. Because that was their defiance. That was their weapon. What else did they have? And it's not just this work. It's music that was created, the poetry that came out of those camps. So, I mean, I show visual works of art, but it's all these creative efforts that reminded people that they were still human beings. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.